Russell is one of Eastern Iowa's best known and most versatile actors. He's performed with various theatrical companies around the region over the past 40 years or so. His most recent roles have included Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, the title role in The Real Inspector Hound, The Intrepid Juror No. 8 in Twelve Angry Men, and many others. And Rip, you are just now about to go into rehearsal for a performance of Oliver, which mm -hmm. will be opening in December at the Coralville Center for the Performing Arts, is that correct? Yes, yes, uh, it's a City Circle Acting Company production and it opens December 11th at uh, Coralville Center for Performing Arts, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is the Christmas play, the traditional Christmas play that uh -huh. uh, Coralville City Circle puts on. Right. Ordinarily, it's a Christmas-oriented play, but Oliver is not so much Christmas-oriented as it is a sort of a humanitarian type of show, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I'm, um, it's uh, somewhat of a curious uh, uh, slot to fill for this play in that, in that normal slot in, in uh, December. Um, but I think the director, Liz Tracy, mentioned the other night that if she, if she can, she might want to put a little snow in there to give an indication of maybe a little uh, winter weather, maybe a tree in the background. But yeah, it's, uh, it's not your traditional. I know that, well, as you well know, we've done, um, of course, A Christmas Carol many right. years, a number of years. Uh, so it's a little bit of an odd choice for that slot of uh, that time of year, but I think it's going to be a big hit. It's got a great cast. It's got a huge cast. Yeah, it does. And you are playing what role in this production? Well, I'm playing a small role, Dr. Grimwig. He is a, he's a doctor that comes to, um, to examine Oliver when he's in the house with uh, Mr. Brownlow. Uh, That's right. Turns out to be a long lost relative. That's right. And as I recall, Dr. Grimwig is rather eager to believe the worst of Oliver. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He's got, when he finds out that Oliver is there because he actually picked the pocket of Mr. Brownlow, or actually he didn't pick the pocket, but he was picked up and charged for it and arrested. And that's when Mr. Brownlow brought him back home and sort of took him under his own wing. But uh, yeah, yeah, he's, uh, he's sort of a shady character. He thinks the worst maybe of Oliver. He also is a character who, um, who likes to be right all the time, but he doesn't always say the right thing. He sort of lets goes with the flow, and if somebody corrects him, he'll say, oh yes, of course, well that's what I meant, you know. It's, okay. Yeah. So he's a little bit at odds with himself. So when you get a new role, do you have a particular process that you go through in figuring out how you're gonna play the part and then learning it and so on, or does your process vary from show to show? It doesn't really vary. I basically, I look at the line, I, you know, I try to figure out what the character is about, uh, who the character is, what, obviously all the basic acting 101 techniques, what they want from the scene, you know, how they go about it, their ulterior motives, you know, what do they say besides, versus what they want, uh, subtext type things. Uh, and, uh, and basically then it's just learning the lines and starting to feel the character. Um, I'm not what one would call a method actor. I don't, in, I don't let the character you know, inhibit, in, inhabit my, my body, my persona. I just try to take the character and find out what he wants and, and, then, and then learn the role that way and, and let the rehearsal process sort of take its toll that way. I mean, you've got usually many weeks to rehearse, so I've got quite a bit of time to find that character and sort of get comfortable in the character's skin and then just sort of let it come out on the stage. Okay, now a few months ago you played a role that probably every American actor dreams of playing. Mm -hmm. That was Willie Loman in Arthur Miller's play, Death of a Salesman. Can you tell me a little about that role and that play and how you went about mastering it? And maybe tell me a little about what you might have done differently with that role that, than other actors have done with it. Well, um, First of all, he's about the character's about my age, and I have had some experience playing um, Arthur Miller characters. I, I had the uh, the good fortune to play um, John Proctor in The Crucible a number of years ago at Bruce Moore up in Cedar Rapids. Um, just last year, I was uh, Walter in The Price, another Arthur Miller play. Um, a few years ago at Dreamwell, I, I played um, Eddie Carbone in A View from the Bridge. So I have kind of an idea about what this character is, is like. Several of those characters, actually I think three of them, all kind of origin, originate from a New York, Brooklyn sort of a base. Um, certainly Eddie Carbone and certainly Willie Loman. So I took that 
and I'm not from the East Coast, uh, but it, it seems to be a comfortable character for me to kind of play, slip into that, uh, to, to those shoes and um, take on that accent. Um, Willie Loman is just a real tragic figure, you know, so it's, it was just a matter of, of learning how he deals with his family, uh, the aspirations that he had versus the aspirations that he wants for his children, specifically Biff, and, um, and how those, those ideas and those notions can be kind of at odds with one another. You know, he certainly, there was a lot of failings in his life, um, Willie's life himself. So he, I think, one of the ways that I, I looked at it, I kind of looked at my own life and my own father. My father was a very remarkable man. He was a professional, uh, uh, he was an architect. Um, but in a way, I think he always felt that he underachieved. He didn't quite get to where he wanted to get in his profession. And he looked tired, you know, towards the end of his, his career. He just looked like a tired kind of a salesman in a way. And so I did pull a lot of that in from my own experience with him. Um, and other than that, like I say, I just look at the script, look at what he wants from other characters and, and, uh, and the play in general, and just kind of take it from there. That may have been what made Willie Loman such an unforgettable character and has allowed him to stand the test of time because he is such a universal character. Mm -hmm. Well, he's everyone. He's, you know, uh, his, uh, his actual name uh, is Low Man, uh, Loman. And it's like he's kind of everybody. He's everybody, every working stiff. He, he represents sort of that post-war, you know, idealism. Of let, let, me, let me, you know, do the, what I can for my family and, and strive as hard as I can. Some people make it, some people don't. And he just never, you know, really did. And uh, so there he wants the best for his family. And it kind of, kind of backfired in a way. He didn't really know how to go up go about it. Right, and you've done quite a few plays by Arthur Miller, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, does Miller present particular challenges for the actor, other than, different from other playwrights? One of the things about Miller is his writing is just, I mean, it, it sounds cliche, but it's just so beautiful. I mean, he's not a Pulitzer Prize winning one of America's greatest playwrights for nothing. Um, and it's it's really an honor to 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 say his words uh, coming out of your mouth. and. As any actor will tell you, the, everybody paraphrases. Somebody, some people paraphrase a great deal, some people paraphrase a little. With Arthur Miller, you always strive to get the words just right because they're, they're written in, an, in that order for a reason. And it's so beautiful to hear some of the phrasing come out. It's not eloquent, but it's just, it's eloquent in his own way, the way he writes for those characters. And so that's always a challenge with, with Arthur Miller. Um, other than that, it's just, you know, the challenge, of course, is to try to do him justice. Exactly, yeah, the believability of Miller's dialogue is really quite remarkable. I would say mm -hmm. the same for Tennessee Williams, and I think it's ironic that one of their contemporaries, a fellow named Clifford Odets, was the guy who really got the ball rolling in terms mm -hmm. of realism in American theater, and yet Odets's dialogue seems so stilted, so difficult to believe, mm -hmm. it's almost embarrassing. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with Odets, although I do believe I was in one Clifford Odets play. I think he wrote Waiting for Lefty, yeah. if I'm not uh, mistaken. It's one of the first plays I did um, as a theater major here at the university. I came in 1977 um, when there was an old armory building, which is down where the communications building is now. It was, a, it, was a, it was a fire trap. I mean, if you lit a match in that place, the whole thing would go up. Oh, sure. But we did, do you remember the old armory? You, oh, yeah. You, oh, yeah, of course. You, you would have remembered. Yeah, of course. Um, but I did a play in that in that space with some remarkable actors. A couple of them, um, Mark Fite and um, a couple others, went on to some great uh, success. Mark, especially, he's working actor in Hollywood right now as well. But um, I don't really res remember the the language so much of Odette's, but I do remember having an impact on me at the time. Well, if you've seen the movie Barton Fink, right. Barton Fink was based pretty much on oh, Odette's. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the Coen Brothers. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. Now, are there are certain playwrights that are your all-time favorites? I mean, whenever a play of theirs goes up, you really want to be in it because it's that particular playwright? You know, to be honest, no. I mean, um, Arthur Miller aside, because now that I've done four plays, I want to keep doing his canon, um, All My Sons and, and um, others. Um, but I don't really search out playwrights. I... I uh, I look at the seasons coming up, all the local theaters 
here in Iowa City and, and certainly Cedar Rapids. And I try to identify ones that, they, uh, that would have a part for a late 50s actor, for one thing, and then try to fit it in, see what my schedule looks like. And if it's that interesting, then I'll, I'll go for it. And then I'll read the script. But I don't really have, uh, I don't really, besides Arthur Miller, I don't feel that I have a uh, strong connection to any single playwright. Okay. Now, do you have a, an all-time favorite role that you ever played in the, your entire career? You know, probably that's a t that's a tough one. That's a that's a tough one because um, I've played some good roles. Um, besides the roles we mentioned, I uh, had the opportunity to play juror number eight in uh, in Twelve Angry Men. Uh, I I've uh, I've played um, um, in To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch. Um, probably those two and and Willie Loman would have to be right at the top of the list. I mean, just as far as a, that's a mouthful to, you know, to bite off a role like that. And I, I think that probably, you know, if I died tomorrow, I could at least say that I did that role. And that's, that's terrific. I know there's going to be others, but that might be at the, the top of the list, that one. Okay. Now, what would you say was your biggest challenge in making that part yours and making it good? You know, I think it, a lot of it comes with the physicality and the relation to the other characters. I, I had the opportunity to work with a wonderful cast, uh, but in particular, um, Krista Newman, who played uh, who played Linda Lohman, um, and uh, she's a, a professional actress and uh, extremely good on stage. So it was it was really terrific to be able to work with her and form that relationship in our scenes together. And I think probably just the physicality of, of Willie Loman. You know, he had to look tired. He had to look browbeat. You know, he, he had to look like when he came in with his bags at the end of the day, carrying his luggage, and he'd driven 600 miles, and he hadn't made a dime. I mean, you really, really had to make it look like that, that road weary on his face. So that was a particular challenge. Um, um, other than that, you know, it's just, it's just, just carving out the character. Okay. Now, what makes a good actor different from a bad one? I mean, when you're in a show, you're going to have to deal with different mm -hmm. levels of talent. Mm -hmm. How can you spot somebody and say, oh, she's going to be a pleasure to work with. Oh, this person cannot act a lick. I'm going to have a lot of trouble here. Mm -hmm. How do you make the difference and how do you cope? Well, first of all, it's, it's community theater. So um, we have lots of different levels of, of talent and ability. It certainly would be the same thing with anything, musicians, sports, uh, literature, anything. Um, and it's terrific that we have people that audition it and, 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 filling, and filling out roles. Um, I, you know, everybody's a challenge to work with. Um, but the, the people that maybe are a little less experienced, you know, all you can do is, is what I try to be very supportive with them. I try to make, always make sure that we have a connection on stage. I think the most important thing about acting is listening. Um, it's not necessarily saying your lines, but it's listening to the other character. Because if you have a strong bond with another character and vice versa, there's going to be a connection there. And the words will just, they'll come out and they'll just be a bonus. So whatever I, I'm working with somebody that might have less experience, um, I always try to make them comfortable and establish a connection and don't leave them hanging. And then I think they just get more natural and feel more comfortable. Um, and then the people that do have a lot more experience is just a real pleasure to be able to just freewheel it, you know? Right. I've found that when I'm dealing with an inexperienced actor, the more I react to them, the better mm -hmm. they get. Mm -hmm. Do you find mm -hmm. that to be the case also? I think so, too. you got to feed them back and give them positive, you know, I mean, it's, I don't mean to make it sound like a Pavlov sort of thing, but you have to give them positive reinforcement because that'll build up their self-esteem. That'll build up, um, you know, what they're trying to, to achieve in, in the scene right. and make them feel better. I mean, just like anything else. And, and most people are, with very few exceptions, most people are really, really quite effective and good on stage. You know, you get some people that... Maybe they're better off behind the scene. But. Right. But what I mean is if you are up there performing with them, mm -hmm. if you show them that you're listening and reacting to their lines, then they will tend to say their lines with, with more express, expression and with more professional polish. Exactly. Okay. Now, how does someone get into this? If I say to you, you know, I've always wanted to act. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of appearing on stage 
It's, has always appealed to me, but I don't know a thing about it. What are some of the most elementary things you need to learn if you are contemplating getting into the theater? Well, um, really, you don't really need to learn anything. You just know how to be, you, you need to know how to be connected. And in this day and age, when I was first doing theater 35, 40 years ago in this town, of course, it was way before the internet, it was way before Facebook, all that stuff. You just looked in the paper and there would be audition announcements. Uh, this, and that's a very good question because this is, a, this is a question that's kind of ongoing and kind of plaguing the theater community and any, in this community and other areas as well. But how do you get involved and how do you find out about what's going on? Well, first of all, you have to show an interest and you have to go out and seek the places that the information will be at, like Facebook, newspapers, word of mouth, um, but there's so many outlets. Everybody is looking for people to audition. You know, if there's one, if there's one problem that the theaters tend to have sometimes is we don't get enough people to come out and audition. Right. So just go for it. You know, look, ask your friends. And there's lots of other things obviously to be done besides on stage, in and around theater, backstage, costuming, makeup in some areas. Certainly all the technical aspects of theater. But um, really, just just ask your friends and and. Um, and join Facebook clubs that you know that that have theater activities going on. So okay. Mm -hmm. Now I recall when I was acting in high school, the problem was we never had enough boys. Yeah. Does that happen also uh, as adults, or is it not enough girls, or what? Well, by and large, I'd say it's the same problem. I mean, more more or less. Um, I think I think um, sometimes uh, the artistic flair comes out in genders maybe more female than male as far as as far as uh, theatrical type endeavors I, that's just a guess I don't know but it seems like there, there's a lot of times there are more girls that come out you know th than guys um, but it depends on the play right like for instance next year 1776 that City Circle is doing I would imagine uh, guys will come out out of the woodwork for that and that's very cross well I hope not too many of them do well, because I want a nice big part in that show yeah, well, and I don't I want think, much competition I think that's excellent <laughs> I think you got a good chance but um, but a, thing, a play like 1776 of course you're gonna draw not only theater people actors but you're gonna bring in musicians and and singers right etc so you are already you've increased the population for your auditioners you know two or three fold okay mm -hmm. now we're, we've probably got a lot of beginning aspiring baby actors watching this show mm -hmm. right now so I was wondering if you could tell us a little about some of the common mistakes that beginning actors make that are easy to avoid if only you know how to avoid them mm -hmm. well the biggest mistake I think um, young actors make or any actors make is just trying too hard pushing it too much um, if you're going to play a character as a young person, um, don't necessarily try to be too over the top at first. Um, well, you can always pull it back, of course. But the thing, the main thing with acting is just being yourself, um, because that's what acting is. You look at somebody, by and large, the majority of all acting that you see on television or movies are just people being themselves, and that's what's easier than that. So don't push too hard. Um, like I said before, listen, listen, listen to your other actors on stage. Even if you know the dialogue, front and forwards and backwards, make sure that you're making a connection with the people that you're on stage with. Um, there's nothing worse than seeing <clears throat> an amateur production or a younger production where you see people coming out and they're just like, so Billy, tell me about your day. And Billy's over here and they're, and they're looking out saying, well, Jim, I went to the store, I bought some bread, I bought some milk. They're not making a connection right. between the two of them. Right. So you've got to establish that, first of all. I think that's really one of the most, if not the most important thing about acting at, a, at any level is, is connecting with your, with your fellow stage mates. Right. Another point I have noticed, you mentioned that listening is so very important. And I agree, acting is all about listening. I find that it's especially important when you have to learn an accent. Mm -hmm. For example, so many people, when they're learning, when they think they know how to do a British accent, mm -hmm. will just do it all wrong because they have not been listening to how a real Englishman right. talks. Mm -hmm. So you have to do that. You have to understand what is natural mm -hmm. behavior. You, one mistake that I notice a lot in beginning actors is indicating. For example, if you want to say, you know, I hurt my arm yesterday. Mm -hmm. A beginning actor will say, I hurt my arm yesterday. Mm -hmm. Right. Pointing to things like that. 
Exactly. Well, that's a very that's an excellent uh, that's an excellent. You, you have to, um, and that's what I mean about being yourself. Not everybody would say I hurt my arm and then grabs your arm. You can just tell them that. Um, you don't need to illustrate everything that you do. Right. It's just it's just enough to suggest it with the words. And it's interesting you said about the the British accents because we're doing Oliver and I. I was at a rehearsal the other night with some, and the younger kids were being rehearsed, and um, and Liz Tracy, the director, was saying, okay, you guys are doing fabulous with your British accents, but the best thing you can do is just go listen and watch everything British. You know, go home and watch the BBC or turn on something that with got authentic British actors on it, a movie, whatever it may be, and just listen. And that's how you learn accents. You know, you can do the phonetics and study the study the language and look at books, but really it's just listening and then taking that and taking that on. I agree, and one piece of advice that I learned about how to do a British accent, and it's probably the most valuable piece, is that if you just pitch your voice about a minor sixth higher than you mm -hmm. ordinarily would for an American accent, you notice I'm not changing my pronunciation at all. I'm using standard American pronunciation. Mm -hmm. I'm just pitching it a minor sixth higher, so I immediately sound more English. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly, that, that, and that's what it takes. I do, you know, it's the same thing if you do an Irishman. It's like whenever I try to do an Irish accent, it's always, all right, top of the morning to you. You know, what you be doing this morning? No, so good to see you. And then all of a sudden you find yourself going up high because that's your interpretation of it, which isn't always the case, but uh, it's kind of an easy trap to fall into. But in, in for the British, it does help because it lends you, it gives you that air of austerity and, and the fact that you're just a little, a little higher than the next person. Exactly mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And speaking of uh, the Irish, you know why an Irishman only eats 239 beans at a given meal? Uh, no. Because any more would be too farty. <laughs> Okie dokie. So what was the most out of character, most opposite role that you've ever had, the most unlike Rip that you've ever had to be oh, on boy. stage? Oh boy, uh, that's a good question. I'd have to think a little bit for that. And those are the funnest roles to play too, because they're they're so much unlike you, but you still have to base them in realism. Um, gosh. Yeah, that's why to... Scrooge was so much fun for me because I'm Scrooge in real life. Let's face yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, listen, one of these days you have to so have, give yourself a just challenge. Just playing yourself is yeah. fun, but playing the opposite of yourself mm -hmm. can also be awfully fun. Yeah. Well, I think some small, you know, so character roles are always fun because they're just like kind of like unlike anybody. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of roles like Bardolph in, in Merry Wives of Windsor and um, just little character roles where the guy might be a drunk, you know, and he's in the bar and he's, and he's uh, falling around. Um, you know, so roles like that. I, it's escaping me right now, which if I, I come back to that one, maybe if I can think about what role might... Now, playing a drunk person is always a challenge, isn't it? Because you don't want to overdo mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And there's a key to playing drunk. Excuse me as I take a drink. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm not an expert on this. I don't drink anymore. But, um, but one, the, when you try to play, when you play drunk, the one thing you don't want to do is, is play drunk. Right. The secret to playing drunk is playing someone who is trying not to be drunk. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's just the same way if you're in real life and you're talking to a police officer or your significant other and you're trying to hold it all together. So the secret to playing drunk is like, you know, um, tr illust showing like you're keeping it together, not that you're falling all over the place. Right. Because that's just a, that's just a stereotype. It's very much like if you're playing somebody in love and you're interacting with the person you're in love with and you might want to not be too obvious about mm -hmm. the fact that you're crazy about her because that will turn her off. Yeah, yeah, and exactly, and that's all part of the uh, give and take of love anyway is like, you know, um, poking fun at somebody or, or, or acting the opposite some way. You know, you always, you know, you, whenever you like somebody, one of the things that you do is, tend to do is kind of uh, be mean to them. And that, you know, it's, it's a strange thing, but then, it's, then it really means you like them. Are romantic roles difficult for you, or do they present different challenges than a non-romantic role? Mm, not really. There it comes, it, 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 it comes down to the connection you make with the person you're playing opposite of. Um, I like playing romantic roles because they're just so fun. They're, most of the time they're just, they allow for a lot of playfulness, and that's always a fun thing to do on stage. Um, you know, I've, I've played opposite a lot of young women and, and even a, a man or two um, uh, uh, over the ages. Um, but now you're on the subject, you know, I, my, my wife Janice is, is very obviously a very big supporter and of my theater um, career in the last 
30 years or so. And um, one of the greatest things that I ever heard her say was my nephew, when he was about eight years old, uh, he's 22 now, asked Janice, he says, you know, Aunt Janice, don't you get jealous when you see Rip up on stage kissing another woman? And I, I froze, not, not quite sure what she was going to say to him. And she said, well, Jacob, um, not really, because when Rip's up on stage, he's playing a character. So it's not him kissing the woman, it's his character kissing the other character. And I'm like, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you, Janice. That's why I married her. And that's the truth. That's the truth. But there still has to be a, a connection. You can hate somebody off stage and, uh, and get to get, look at, you know, um, oh, I'm thinking of... Um, Abbott and Costello? Abbott and Costello didn't get along so well, but neither did um, Vivian Vance and um, William Frawley. Oh, my gosh, as Ethel, yeah. Ethel and, and Fred Mertz on the I Love Lucy hated each other. Oh, yeah. Hated each other. And they would get on and they'd do their scenes oh. as sort of a curmudgeon -y old loving couple. Right. But We've um, all had situations where we had to act opposite somebody that we really yeah. didn't like much as a person. Yeah. But somehow you work it out. You're always teammates for yeah. the time being and you manage. But, yeah, because but you're still, professionals. In that but sort still, of, you can get sort of a little bit of mean satisfaction. I remember a show I was in once where this girl that I was crushing on was kissing another guy on stage. Right. And I didn't like that guy at all. Yeah. And she revealed to me afterwards that that guy was just a lousy, lousy stage kisser, and it was very unpleasant for her. Mm -hmm. And so for the rest of that show, I was going around smirking inside, saying, ha-ha, yeah. I know you're a crummy kisser. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always suspected as much. Exactly, exactly. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so maybe you can tell me about what is on your bucket list. Are there certain shows that you really, really want to be in, certain roles that you really want to play? Well, you know, we just talked about Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross a few minutes ago before we started doing the show. Lots of good parts that, in that. Lots of good parts in that. I've always thought that would be a great part. I'm not really quite sure what role to play. Um, the Jack Lem I'm a huge Jack Lemmon fan, so I always think of the roles that he's played in movies. And so the Shelley role, role would be a lot of fun to play in that. I dare um, say. Um, just, uh, just more of the same. I, I like those... Um, you know, I'd like to do some more Shakespeare. I haven't done a ton of Shakespeare in my life, you know, a handful of plays. Uh, it, it's always fun to do that. I'd like to do, I'd like to, I don't really have any roles that I can really point to and say, golly, I, I really want to do that. I just, I tend to let things sort of come at me. And, okay. And, uh, well, of but, the Shakespeare you've done, do you have a favorite role that you did? Well, you know, I, the most recent one was last year. I, I played, um, I played uh, in, uh, in Much Ado About Nothing. I played Leonardo. Uh -huh. And that was a great role. That was a fun role because it's a little wild sort of. A, he went from ecstatic you know, notions to to the depths of despair when he thought that his his daughter was um, was cheating on her soon to be. So it was a lot yeah, of fun of playing that role. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And whatever your character is, you can always find fun stuff to do with that character. And that I think is really what makes acting such a wonderful profession yep. or hobby or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I'm afraid we have to wrap up for this evening, but thank you very, very much, Rip Russell, and best of luck to you in all your future endeavors, mm -hmm. and thank you all.